Welcome back, everybody, after that short break. And Gary, thank you very much for some really interesting insights in that, uh, in that last presentation. Been really looking forward to this particular panel session. Uh, as with the two previous panel sessions we've had over the days, we've got some real heavyweights on this to really be able to cover off the, this, the, this, this particular set of topics at the end of the day. So what I'll do, I'll introduce the panel and then hand over to Sam, who will actually chair it. So we have Professor Duncan McFarland from University of Cambridge. We have Geraldine Arajeta, who's the Chief Commercial Officer at the Digital Catapult. Ian Bouquet Taylor, who you heard from earlier, uh, from AE Aerospace. Uh, Sam Turner, who's the CTO of the High Value High Value Manufacturing Catapult, who will be chairing this particular session. We have Steve Ashton uh, from Worcestershire County Council. And we have Stephen Douglas, who's the head of 5G strategy at Spirit Communications. So we should get some really interesting insights from this panel. So Sam, on that note, I'll just hand over to you. Thank you, Mike, and afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the, this panel session. So um, one of the exciting things about this conference this week, I think, is bringing together the worlds of, of manufacturing and, and communications. Um, and really trying to find the sweet spot where we can start to transform the, the manufacturing world. And it, it all comes down ultimately to business case. So I think we've seen great examples of opportunity, of the underpinning technology, of the demand for manufacturing, um, of some of the kind of early dots and leaders. But I think to, to have the impact that we really want to have um, across the sector, we need to help um, organizations, businesses understand the, the, the business case and look at the role that test beds can play also in, in demonstrating and developing that. So I'm going to start off with an opening question to my colleague Geraldine at Digital Catapult. So where do we start in terms of building a business case? Hi, Sam. Um, thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak on this question. So in terms of where do we start? I think it's very important if we're talking about test beds and if we're talking about 5G, we need to start at what is the, the first of all, the business challenge or the market opportunity that a business wants to address or explore. Then you're looking at what are those business KPIs, which are the right use cases that you can start to outline at the beginning, and then being able to develop a method of, I normally call it return on digital investment, but normally it's a business case, right? And it's being able to understand which are the right use cases? You shouldn't just be one, but you could you know, select three priority ones. Looking at what are your business KPIs that you need to be able to address in how these use cases will be able to address them, as well as access to operational data. This is really important. If you don't have access to operational data that you can evaluate those use cases against, you, you pretty much can't do the evaluation. And then it's understanding what is the cost, in this case, of 5G or any digital technology that you're going to deploy to enable those use cases. Who are the suppliers? What skills do you need? Because you need to be able to cost that out if the business doesn't have those skills. They need to hire them or partner with an organization or a supplier to be able to provide that. How do you then leverage an ecosystem of innovators that needs to be part of that business case? As well as, you know, what type of, um, because you will do the investment on a proof of concept if you go ahead with that, and then being able to scale that. And what is the cost projection that you could see when we've done, we did a, a, a very interesting program with Ericsson and a number of manufacturing companies. We were able to select three different use cases when we did it with them and work with their operational staff as well as their financial staff to be able to work. And in this case, Ericsson was the hardware supplier and in digital catapult to be able to bring together a number of different of those data qualities and apply that to the running of the business. And where were some of those challenges? You know, one of those challenges is asset tracking, you know, actually knowing where the assets are. If you want to implement robotics, how do you know what the wireless robotic impact on your business could be? And one of the things that we found as we were doing the business case analysis 
is that your return on investment will always look better if you are combining use cases with the deployment of the technology. That's when you start to create value and really unlocking not only cost efficiencies, but operational efficiencies as well as unlocking new business models. And you can, you know, we, we've seen um, we've seen outputs of 12 to 18 months of being able to see the return on digital investment or when you deploy the technology. So I, I will leave it there and maybe um, uh, other panelists would like to comment on that approach or add to it. Sam, you're on mute. Apologies, uh, so nearly failed with a pound in the mute jar. Um, no, thank you, Jolene. A really interesting observations. I think some really useful guidance as well on, on where you start out um, to, to build the business case. And I, I like the, the point you made about the ROI is better if you've got combined use cases. And I think particularly as a manufacturing firm, if you're trying to um, you've got to build the skills and, and network, then, then that, the, the kind of overhead is spread across those those use cases. And it's about problem. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing from Steve, your, your viewers. You've, you know, you've, you've got the, um, the the test bed in Worcestershire and you know, how you, does that ring true what Geraldine has said Where, how would you go about building that that yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't disagree with anything anything that Geraldine has said. I, you know, I, I think back to telling the story of when we when we started to look at five G back in 2016 in Worcestershire, and and the, the the first kind of questions, apart from well, what about thinking from a social perspective? What about two G, three G, four G? We said, well, it's not necessarily about that. At the minute, we we were thinking enterprise to begin with, and the two sectors that we saw as the biggest areas were enterprise industry 4.0, and also a health health and social care sort of space as well. That was the country council's view for the benefit of a local area and I think place has got a big part to play in that but coming back to the business side I think very often when businesses approach us from the test bed they'll ask the, they'll say we, we want to get involved in 5g and very often the, the, just because that's what they're looking to do is maybe if they forward think as we're very early adopters we said why, why 5g is, is our response but when, when we start to get into it I think for me I always look at what they're looking to gain what's that benefit is it about improving the productivity a process a system is it about picking up a particular issue an issue that they have uh, improving customer satisfaction with 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 Yamazaki Mazaki it was very much it wasn't necessarily about productivity or process improvement for them uh, it was really looking at how their customers might be satisfied by their products they were moving into that space making the CNC machines um cab, obviously we talked a lot about the carbon neutrality challenge training needs those kind of things and Ian, Ian, Ian who's on the panel as well said earlier about you know starting things small and I think that's abso absolutely the case you know you you focus on what your real objectives are and what your gains are but very quickly coming to Geraldina's point which is you start to realize there's actually a whole host of other areas of second third and fourth opportunities can come along very quickly um, I think we have to appreciate that you know, we're not doing technology for technology's sake here. It needs to resolve a problem or an issue. But I think one of the one of the key things around 5G test beds is people very often will not know they have a problem. Again, in another panel area, the unknown unknowns were talked about. And there's assumed false truths in engineering around uh, you might always lose 20% uh, uh, through a particular process or the, the usage of that machine is always going to be the same or we've already done this, we tried it with Wi-Fi and it didn't work. So there I think the next question is, is really, you know, the capabilities of 5G and people understanding what they are. And I think that's what test beds give. Test beds give that opportunity without necessarily that capital investment in the first place to, to sort of have a play with some of those um, those concepts, those ideas, to allow you to build that strong business case and 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 and, and suck it and see a little bit. So you're not building a business case, let's say, um, with a, a whole load of issues. In people have gained the hard yards, and I guess the second, the, the final thing I'd say on this particular one is talk to people. Um, on the on from an industrial perspective, on on industry 4.0, there's been quite a few test beds. Now there's quite a few people working in that space with DCMS. They, they want to share that information. They want to share those learnings and those findings. The hard yards have been done in many cases. Um, so, you know, not just necessarily come to Next Year Works Worcestershire 5G, but talk to other people in that space who've done it and the partners that they've worked with, as I say, such as, um, such as Ian there at, at, at Aerospace. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, just one question for you, actually. So you, are you still seeing most of the companies you're working with being those early adopters who are interested to explore the opportunity? Or are people coming with actual problems saying, help me fix this problem? Uh, a mix, a mix, Sam. 
So we, you, you've got people who are looking at an opportunity for either a new product or a new system or a new process. But we, we, we also do have, this is an issue for us. So um, to, whilst not an SME, but look to, uh, to Bosch, Worcester Bosch, um, they, the, their issue was with their AGVs and, and, and they came to us with a, once we'd done the first few use cases with them, we're in remote sensing, et cetera, the AGVs was a problem that they needed to resolve. They made an investment in AGVs and they wanted to look at how they were going to optimise and, and, and benefit from that. Great, thanks, Dennis. Really, really insightful. Um, I might, as you've been name dropped, Ian, I come to you next, uh, just on how you build the business case and you know the idea of starting small, I suppose, as well. Well, I think that the, the first thing was, you know, we we've had a lot of support in developing where we are from uh, Westminster's 5G, Ericsson, and BT in in sort of like scoping. So we we uh, taking Geraldine's, we had a hundred thousand ideas to start off with, you know. What, what, what things we wanted to do and I, I think at the outset we didn't know that 5g was the answer for that and i think it was a case of you know some of the ones we talked about we whittled out because 5g wasn't the answer for that you could do that with existing technology and, and moving on it's where it became limited by either trying to do an awful lot of things at the same time as in lots of devices connected or handling huge amounts of data in a faster um, way than you could uh, uh, currently um or just the stability of having a, a 5g network rather than um a wi-fi network or something similar so when we looked at that it was it was a case of let's dismiss everything we think is faff around this process and let's go to the core so we then built three use cases quite um robust use cases and you know in, in terms of it and 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 even in that we've got uh, our opinion is we've got two really really strong will make a massive difference to us and one this is a really good interesting project that's going to make a difference if it if it fully works out but we run the risk of knowing we're pushing the boundaries of what we're doing with our technologies here so but that's that's part of the understanding of how our 5g project works it's it's let's show that it can work in an industrial environment. And I take uh, Geraldine's point, you know, and, and Steve's a second ago. The whole thing about this is it has to stack up to an SME. Um, you know, in, my, in our case, you know, don't get me wrong. If you're if you're a mid cap or a large company, it's got to stack up as well. It's, it's a bigger rollout. But considering what we've just come through in the pandemic and where we've been and how it's affected people, if I can look at this to help me gain and improve my uh, competitive advantage by being faster, slicker, better informed on a day-to-day basis, then it starts to add up into that business case and, and, and that's where we looked at it. So the, the three use cases you heard of on the video this morning, every one of those has a return on investment based around the, the, the project um, with Westminster 5G. Um, and every one of those, I honestly believe, will give us a return greater than we were expecting um, and in a faster speed than we were expecting, to be honest with you. The adoption, I think there's there's, there's a general negativity about anything new when you go into manufacturing. You can take away an old machine and put a shiny one, they like it, until it starts doing something different. Um, but if you look at what we're doing, um, I've now got a group of guys down the shop floor that are like, why haven't we done this before? Why do I need paper? Why do I need, you know, what, um, the, 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 the plan on a wall somewhere where I can have the plan straight in front of me on the screen and it's live and it updates automatically? So from their point of view, I've got some buy-in. I think that's nice at, at, at that small scale. Um, we will expand it. There are no two ways about this. We will expand it and take it across the whole business because we can see the benefit of doing that. And that's not because we get to come on things like this and talk about it and people like us and that sort of thing. It's nothing to do with that. It's it's all about the fact that I can see a cost benefit for everything I'm doing, even though there's you know a fair bit of time and support required to get it up and running in the first place. I see. Great. Uh, one question for you, actually. Another question. The um, talking about starting with a real problem and use case, starting small, and, and that's how to change mindsets. So how much of the to, to what degree have you been solving problems that you had known problems you came to the test bed with? And to what degree have you, have you started to uncover new opportunities you hadn't originally considered? Um, I, I would say, actually, I, I, don't know, I am sort of thinking of the top of my head when I say this. I'm probably saying that, that 60% of the benefit we're seeing is in things we thought about. Um, I'd, I'd say 40% of it is what we thought about. And now you're seeing other opportunities. So with the use of the technology, uh, and it's it's... It's those aligned things. So the, the, using our tool to do some, the, so our ERP system 
uh, linking that to teams and getting tracking systems through teams, which we can then send over the network to directly to the machine. So my guys can fill in other documents. They can come up with improvement ideas live at the machine and go, I want to do this now. And you can actually start sending that around the network for approval. We couldn't have done that. would have taken, well, we wouldn't have done it, to be honest with you. We would have sat there and gone, ah, yes, I'll uh, fill out a form for that. That'll go in a hopper somewhere. Someone will put it in a queue. And one day somebody will pick it up and wonder, what was that job I used to make that 13 years ago that now needs improving? Um, and that's how it works on a day-to-day basis. Um, so we can now do that much more quickly. And I think, you know, we, because we've enabled each of the machines to basically be an information centre now, those five machines that are in the, the, the project, that started people thinking about things in a different way. So we've got a, a, a supplementary project that we've got after this about embedding the behaviours. And, and I'm starting to think I probably wouldn't need it. I think people are just going to come to it and go, oh, yeah, this is great. We love the way this works. So, um, and the opportunity. So I think 60% of what we're seeing, truthfully, is actually things we haven't thought we were going to see a benefit from or haven't even considered seeing a benefit from. That's fantastic. Great, great story to hear, Ian. And is it fair to say then you're starting with kind of a business case around a known problem and you start starting to move to sort of business wide transformation? I know it's early days, but that yeah. Was- yeah, no, the, 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 we, yes, is a simple answer. Uh, from a, as I said in the video, our, 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 um, our major issue is about understanding the capacity we have going forward. And, and in reality, trying to, I suppose the right word to use is sell that capacity as a service rather than just waiting for a baby to land on the doorstep and it's a part we've got to make. Yeah. Um, and and the, the simplest analogy I can use for anybody that's not worked in manufacturing like we do is the, the difference between walking into a barber's or having to wait in a queue to get your hair cut and ringing up the hairdressers and getting a booking in for three weeks on Friday. That's what we're trying to do to our customers. So they send it in and go, when can I have it? And we'll tell them it's eight weeks and you've got to sit and wait for it, rather than getting in touch with us first and booking the space for the machine up front so we can actually change that around. Now, the, the, the analogy moves on. It's a bit like going to DFS and asking for a sofa so you pay a deposit. And that's what we want to do. You give us a bit of money up front, we'll book you the space, we'll buy the material, it'll be here, we'll make the part, we'll send it out. Rather than you send us a drawing, we have to interrogate it, work out where it's going to be, at all adds length on the time and everything else. It, 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 it will completely change the way I interact with my customer. Now, that's the initial problem. The rest of it comes as the benefits of, trying to find ways to make that, that, that schedule as smooth as possible and the predictability. So as, as Steve and I talked about um, in a previous conversation, it is not about going faster and quicker. It's about being more reliable and being more predictable because we all get fed up when you get an email from uh, your provider telling you your box is going to be three, three days later because it's stuck on a ship somewhere. Um, my customer gets exactly the same. For me, it's about... You want it on Tuesday morning at seven o'clock. You get it Tuesday morning at seven o'clock because that's when it'll be planned for. Um, and the predictability of that. So the, one of the metrics out of our project, uh, or the key metric of our project, is my variance to plan. And there are many ways of doing that. And some of that is understanding that my plan was wrong in the first place because the data was wrong creating that plan. And that's one of the spin-offs we've, we've, we've brought out from it, Sam. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. I can talk to you all day because that's the aerospace machines, my kind of background as well. So it's fascinating to look at these use cases. But uh, I'm going to bring Duncan uh, in next. You, you've been in a lot of work looking at an affordability for SMEs of a broad range of digital technologies and, and thinking about you know, test beds and demonstrations. So you know, the same question, really, Duncan, uh, what, you know, where would you start to build a business case, particularly thinking about SMEs? Yeah, no, and it's really interesting hearing what Ian's been saying because it makes me really, you know, think that there's quite a spectrum of uh, manufacturing SMEs out there, and you know, as some uh, in in quite sophisticated states, and others in relatively elemental states, you know, that are perhaps operating with uh, a couple of machines, and at best, something like a, a you know very limited IT capacity, perhaps an internet connection and Wi-Fi. Uh, and so I, I, I just had, yeah, make, was going to make some comments about the issues around, uh, well, 5G, but business cases in the IT space uh, generally. You know, we, I, I think um, actually the comment that Geraldina made earlier on about the multi-use cases being really important. Uh, you know, it's if I went back to 20 years when we were trying to look at RFID business cases across uh, supply chains, one of the big issues we had was that there was no killer applications 
that. And in fact, we ended up trying to look for what we call massacre applications, which I think is really saying, you know, you've got to find a whole pile of different use cases and justify them collectively. And, uh, you know, I, I actually was talking to a, a small organisation last week who just couldn't justify an asset management um, application. By, because, and I said, well, you know, is this the only application you've got? And they go, no, no, we've probably got another 15 of them. And I said, well, actually, if you put them all together, how does it work? They go, oh, okay, that looks fine. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I, I think historically business cases in the IT space are, are generally quite hard to generate up front uh, and they, they take a bit of imagination often. Um, and, and I guess the approach we've been taking in that shoestring pro program uh, has been to make the initial deployments that people might look at as cheap as possible to begin with. So there's almost not even a need for a business case at that stage and to for them to look at using pilots uh, as a means of testing a piece of technology or a, a new development and, and actually let, let the pilot develop a, a, a better profile for the technology and allow it to be a, a reasonable business case to be developed around that. Uh, and that seems to be a, 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 a nice way to operate. And that kind of leads into the comment about you know, the, the whole aim of this um, session is around test beds. You know, I think test beds are a brilliant way of doing that because perhaps someone else is doing that pilot for you. Uh, or someone is helping you to not only understand the business and the payback, but also to visualise how, how a solution might work, uh, understand how you get access to the technology and give you confidence in the way the technology might be deployed. So I'm, I'm really, you know, as some of you know already, I'm a big advocate for making use of test beds for demonstrations and pilots. Um, and, you know, I think... In some ways, I think, yeah, although I said SMEs have got very limited IT capacity, uh, capabilities, actually that makes 5G a real opportunity because they're kind of, you know, in a way jumping jumping a generation and perhaps not considering the need to have too much IT infrastructure of their own in place, but actually being able to make use of uh, a broader 5G service uh, as, as, as an alternative to doing that. So, I mean, I'll make that comment. You know, it's very hard to be specific about particular SMEs, but if you bear in mind that uh, I think the average uh, number of employees in an SME is some, somewhere between one and two, uh, for you know, for um, and there's three hundred thousand of them uh, roughly in the UK. You know, I think there's a real opportunity if if the, the solutions can be made simple enough, accessible enough, and and as Ian was saying, quick enough to get hold of. That, that that would would certainly create significant interest. So I think I'll stop there. In fact, I'm, I'm yeah. Pro <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. I think yeah, that, that affordability and accessibility is key, isn't it, for the smaller guys? Um, Stephen, I'm going to come to you. You know, not last but not least on this point, but as the guy bringing the magic, uh, how do, how would you go around um, building that that um, build, building a business case then for the five G manufacturing world? Yeah, I mean, I think what everybody's comment on, Sam, is it, I, I think it, I wouldn't disagree with anything there. I mean, we see, in, you know, at a ground level, sort of certainly two, two sort of approaches happening at the moment. Certainly there's there's those industries that simply, they do know the use cases, at least at the higher level, you know, and, you know, it may be, you know, they've already experimented or tried it out, like with things like automation or remote monitoring. Um to the ones that simply just don't know what the potential is. Um, and, and you see a lot of that as well. They, they literally need to be shown, or, or I think as the comments was, ed educated on it and, and what the opportunity was. I, I think what we have certainly seen is that, you know, a, a number of enterprises have certainly been burned in the past, and, that, and that's a challenge to overcome. They've maybe tested out a technology that hasn't delivered. Um, and it makes them certainly nervous or, or a lack of confidence in the business case going forward. I mean, a good example is that we've been doing quite a bit of business in, in Asia Pacific where they've, they've implemented early private networks on LTE, 4G. And, you know, their, their major use cases was, was remote monitoring. Um, and the reality was it didn't succeed for them because, you know, what they needed was really high definition uplink uh, communications rather than just a good 4G network on the downlink side of it. Um, and you know that's made them nervous of it, and but now they're starting to see pilot. So I can actually now realise that use case, um, you know, and 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 that's a, that's certainly one of you know one of the issue areas. 
I think the pilots is absolutely fundamental uh, idea, and we have seen that in a number of markets as well. Is taking it, you know, out of the test beds with a few early either adopters or ones that are willing to do sort of these dual, you know, trials together, and then sharing the information from that, the, the benefits from that um, to the to the broader uh, community, so people can actually see, you know, what benefits really were achieved, what was the ROI um, on that. The only other comment I would say, Sam, is, and we do see quite a bit, is, 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 is you know, it's not just the use case; it's the the implementation cost side of it, and you know, it's you know, in many of these enterprises you're going into, they're brownfield. Um, you know, and uh, you know, building a business case in, in an environment which is bespoke usually per enterprise is is usually is is seen as a bit of a headache. Um, so trying to help them identify, you know, how it would work in in, a, in that brownfield environment. Um, you know, and, and not be overly, you know, you know, not make it sound like it's overly complex that the cost is just going to, you know, just increase crazily. So again, this is where the trial beds, you know, the trials and the test beds can come in and really help. It's demonstrated a sort of similar esque environments, so they get a real clear understanding and feeling of how they could actually implement it in an environment which is sort of as close or potentially similar to what they have. Uh, and again, de-risk um, that concern that they that, that they have that that will simply inflate the cost. That's a really important point, isn't it? I think the majority of companies who are looking at the opportunity here are going to be looking at brownfield sites. Uh, and, and only probably the larger guys who are moving to, to Greenfield would have the bandwidth to move to transformation around digi- you know, 5G comms as well. So, so that's an important role for the test beds, isn't it? Uh, the, what, what about um, the role of the test bed then as a service capability, particularly thinking about this, you know, making it a, a, a recognised environment for, for companies who are using the test bed? I, I, I think that's highly important. I mean, it's, it's some of the work we've been we've been working with a number of you know part partners around the world. And I mean, we have a facility we're, we're engaging with Warwick Manufacturing Group on here in the UK, and that's that's part of its ambition is really to make it a multi-tenanted environment where you know lots of people can come in and use it as a sandbox or a playground or simply as a demonstrator um, to get access to it and having a you know the relevant technologies and capabilities in there to to, to make it applicable, whether it's you know, uh, you know, mapping out the industrial environment with the relevant robotics or machineries, and having the relevant communication environments that are there. I mean, although we're talking a lot about five G from a, I suppose a lot of us think of it as an over the air technology, but it's just as relevant on the fixed infrastructure that the five G network goes on to, which is still going to be a dominant part of it. Um, I mean, a good example at the moment again, we have a we have a number of um, customers at the moment who are trialing sort of network slicing uh, technologies, 5G technologies for uh, for the industrial campuses at the moment. And they're not testing it for from the over-the-air side. They're actually testing it on the on the Ethernet, on the physical fixed wireline side, um, to see what benefits they can get around that there in terms of new security, isolation use cases within the factory environments. Um, so again, you know, and the way they're consuming that today is, is, you know, they're getting access to a test bed. They haven't had to build it. They don't have to staff it. They don't have to manage it. They don't even have to run the test themselves. They can simply consume it as a service. Um, and that's very attractive for them because it's it helps them quickly and rapidly, you know, work out, you know, the business case, the technology case um, without really any any major sunk investment. Yeah, that's a great example, I think, isn't it? And um, yeah, think about security isolation, you, there's a range of use cases there that you're, you're seeing people are using the service for. So, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to come back to Steve next. Just how, how is this working for you in, in Worcestershire in terms of the, um, the role of test bed as a service? Yeah, <clears throat> obviously, po- post our DCMS funding projects, we, we wanted to continue what we'd built here and, and what we'd learned and, 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 and commercialise that. Uh, test bed as a service to us is about giving uh, industry an, an opportunity to have a taste without necessarily the high capital uh, outlay on equipment, uh, a safe environment to trial and play, um, being amongst uh, like-minded parties. We have an on-site um, ex- business accelerator in Beta Den on the, on, at the Malvern Hill Science Park HQ site. Um, and again, w- when you see brains come together there and just conversations that can happen um, over, the, over the table or, or in a coffee machine, that, that's, all, that's all really, really good learning. And other people engage in the testbed. The amount of cost fertilization across people, where people are prepared to talk, especially geeky people who want to talk about these things. Commercially, we, we, might, not, we might not all like people talking like that, but um, it does sometimes happen. Um, and again, I think the environment where, you know, for, from us anyway, Next Works, we're independent. Um, we've got multiple vendors involved in the network. 
we're not selling or trying to push solutions on people where I think a lot of, um, you know, uh, SMEs or, or, or large businesses very often get approached by a technology solution selling to them. And, and it's not that hard sell. It's uh, it's very much a come on a journey with us and, and let's let's share, our, share what we can. Um, experiment with the different technologies. You know, when people talk about standalone, non-standalone, on-site core, virtualized, containerized core. They all sort of form part of the different offer of our test bed, as as do the different environments from a from a from a from a kind of a de- demonstrator space at MTC, where you can also go and try and play as well and bring your full solutions to a an indoor and outdoor lab at, at Malvern Hill Science Park, where you might be able to go outside or come inside and and, and again. Just bring your bring your own handsets is kind of the least bit of the least involved you may want to get in that space, and just put somebody working on the software or the app. And I think you see, you can see customers all the way through that chain, whether they be vendors, M and Os, um, software providers, hardware providers, solutions providers, or you know, you know or the end customer, uh, all have a kind of interest to come and come and come and do that. So I think that's kind of the role for Testbed as a service is to provide that platform, that space um, to to do that in, um, and again. As I say, we talked before. You make an investment, and all of a sudden, it's not the right solution for you. You've just lost that investment, right? Or you, or you need to find a way to recover it. It might not be what you want to do. At least here, you you can see whether it works for you or not. And if it doesn't work, you don't move on, or you go and look at a different technology to provide your solution to your problem, or another organisation to go and partner with. And again, you know, we're not in the space of selling a commercial service afterwards. So if people like what they've found on the test bed, they can go and find another provider afterwards who they may want to go and work with. So that to me is what a test bed should be about. Um, so. Great. I'm sold. I, I agree. That, that's that's a really valuable service, isn't it? So Ian is the person uh, you know, who, who's on the receiving end of this test bed as a service. What's your take? <laughs> I didn't sell them anything. So, oh, Steve set me up there, actually. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Um, I, I think the, the answer is that, uh, uh, from our point of view, we're, 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 I'm going to use that term they always use is strictly, we're on a journey. Um, and um, the, 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 for what we're trying to do is, I think, because we're an early adopter, I think there's a there's almost um, a requirement for us there that, to share what we're doing and, and give give back, you know, from the benefit we're learning. So we've had lots of interest around how things are working. I've, I've, this is this is two of three calls like this I'm on today, sharing information like this around other groups from an SME's point of view. And we are constantly getting asked to do things like this to let people know what it's like in the real world. So as a test bed, we um, we we are just that. You know, I think we know that there's a from everything we do, there's a risk it might not work. From everything we do, there's a pretty good chance it will, to be fair. Sorry about swearing. Um, but from our point of view, it, it, it's worth that 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 you know, we you don't you don't get anything for doing nothing. So I can sit back and wait for all this to come in 10 years' time, um, and it's all normal and it just comes off the shelf. Um, or I could be an early adopter and actually push the boundaries and make it work for what I want to. Now, the partners we've worked with have been absolutely fantastic. And I'm not just talking BT and Ericsson and WM5G. I'm talking about the, the other partners, Sith and uh, Fit Factory and Vision Intelligence, who support us through this, and Mazak, um, who have really embraced the fact that what we're trying to do is create a connected factory. Um, and that's a term that's a lot, used a lot by a lot of people. But what we're trying to do is to make it so we can make things simpler, faster, um, and more repeatable, uh, which at the end of the day is what we will want to do. So when you start talking in those terms, we get a lot of ears sort of suddenly turn towards us and start listening to what's going on because we will make mistakes. And Steve will tell you, we have made mistakes. Um, we, you know, in some of the things we've done. But we picked our pieces up and gone, oh, that didn't work very well. Let's have another go at this and go around it again. And yes, it might delay this, it might do that. But that's what it's about. And I'd rather us, I know that the end goal out of this will be we will be much more effective. So happy to be a test bed, happy to know that literally we're on and off some days and it works it works well. And then we go, right, can we do something better? Can we do something different? Or somebody has another idea. Or as we said earlier, it opens up other avenues of things we've got to pick up and, and run with. But I think, you know, uh, and we've, we've said we're, we're happy to open the doors to people as soon as um, the, the, the COVID restrictions allow us to, to come and see what we're doing and how we're doing. And we're happy to share the fact that not everything's gone right. 
um, and that we may have planned too big to start off with and need to plan smaller or or whatever else. But that that is like the top ten tips, uh, Taylor's top ten tips of um, of five G um, are, are are there for everybody to share because. As Duncan said, when you get down to smaller businesses, we're, we're like 65 people and growing. When you get down to 10s and 15s, there's less people. You put more burden on individuals. So you need to have a framework of how this works easily. You know, if, if tomorrow morning you were going to go out and buy a racking system to put in the back of your building, you'd have somebody new and understood racking. And they'd come in and give you a quote, tell you how it fits together and probably fit it for you there, you know, when, when you place the order. With 5G, we haven't got all, we've got lots of people who know what to do. Putting it into an SME working around current products with, in our case, safety critical products as well, that's different. There's not so many of them around. So we are tentatively stepping. Um, and as we talked about earlier um, with the um, inputs for people like Worcester Bosch, and we've seen, you know, we've talked to them about what they've done, they've got a safety issue in theirs. Um, so all that stuff that, that 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 matters. People want to understand that and, and don't want to make the same mistakes again. So let's make the mistakes here. Use it as a test bed. Learn from it, and offer solutions to people. From you know, by here's a real world example of how it went wrong. We put it right, or here's a real world example of how it went right. Um, and that's I think that's the benefit of being a test bed. Thank you. Ian. I think everyone really appreciate you know your will desire to share the experience is really going to help others and being at that cutting edge. Hopefully you don't get flooded with lot, too many more uh, answers for these, these yeah, sessions today. Tomorrow. I'm starting to feel like Kate Winslet tomorrow. She's been moving from room to room and talking to lots of people who are talking about my latest movie. But, um, uh, you know, uh, but... Uh... Oh, thank you. So, I mean, the, the test bed helping to take some out risk is a really important part of the service for the test bed, isn't it? I suppose you, you, you're taking risk clearly, but it it's maybe more manageable because the test bed is helping you to yeah to absolutely with, without that. without the inputs from them we, we wouldn't be where we are today my name is I'm sorry Duncan you want to say something yeah no I I, I just it's it's great hearing what you've been saying Ian and I, I I just was actually had two questions about you being a test bed in which is like first one how do you work out what it is you can share and what it is you can't share uh you know because some of it's your crown jewels right and uh so how do you work out what access you you are you and obviously people aren't there at the moment, but when they come, what can they access and what what how do you manage your own, you well, know, own they're, operation? They're pretty much governed by the fact that we work in the defense and aerospace sector. So there are things we can't show. You know, yeah. you, you can't go walking off with drawings and things like that. That's not gonna happen, you know. So but in terms of the 5G network and the things we're doing with that. Uh, everything can be shown because it. Right, I'm going to put my hand up and go. I can't win all the work everywhere. It just. I'm just not big enough. There's enough of a market out there. But if I look at what, if I was to say, what are the main reasons I suffer from manufacturing? It isn't just my manufacturing. It's my suppliers. It's even my customers and their inability to do what I'm trying to do. Mm. So for me, if I am the the precursor to everybody else getting on this, excuse the word, bandwagon and learning how to do this well then it makes my life easier later on. And it's almost like a, a return on investment of a different sort. It will, if, if other people pick up and do what we've done, and I've been talking to a couple this morning who are doing something different but similar, um, then from my point of view, it will make life just so much better for all of us because the, net, the network and the sector will get more efficient. There will be more data transported around. Now, there will be limitations around that, Duncan, and you're quite right. You know, um, today I can't send drawings whizzing over the internet without having them encrypted and special passwords sent elsewhere and things like that. That's just the market we live in. But 5G doesn't change that. 5G doesn't stop that happening or interrupt that or make you have to do that. In fact, if anything, it makes it stronger and more secure than we were before. So um, I think that, that, that from when if, if you were to come knocking on the door tomorrow morning, Duncan, and come in and have a wander around, you would see us warts and all. You probably wouldn't know half of what we're looking at, to be honest. Else that goes into something else that eventually goes into a, a in our case, an old Rolls Royce engine or an old um, uh, or apart from a, a Rolls Royce Marine um, unit. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know what it is, but that's just the game we play anyway. So, in terms of what's my five G giving me, I'm quite happy to share pretty much everything because I've learned more than I've actually developed. Probably the best way to put it. Okay, because because the other thing I was just going to add was, you know, I, 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 in the test beds we run, the, we, we, 
we and these are kind of they're in the university, so it's not like there's a problem with um, IP and things like that. But we talk the differentiate between passive and active. In the sense, passive is something people come to look at, and active is where. Uh, and one's not good and one's not bad, but the active one is people come along and say, you know, I really want that. How do I go? How do I go about getting that thing? You know, whether it might be a uh, a monitoring demonstrator or a tra- piece of tracking software or something like that. And I just wonder to to what extent with the different the, with the test bed, it, it's you know people see it and they've, then they've got to do they then have to go away and find someone to do the solution development for them. I think with with most of what we've got, we've partnered with other people who are on the cusp of those technologies anyway. So, right. if you look at the the three um, the, the three main partners, five Westman and five G, BT and Ericsson, obviously they're they're in there doing what they do. The other partners, so Mazak, um, we've just talked to them about enabling the machines and linking them via five G enabled yet, but they will be one day. And so it's, it gives them some benefit out of it. Um, the sensor company Sith, who we use uh, to to produce our uh, using our sensors, they're looking that that, it, that they're pushing their boundaries because they're not using five G sensors now. We're using a, a, a wild band, a wide band real time location sensor, and but the plan is that we would eventually join this project, develop down what does a five G sensor need to look like and how we're going to manage the battery life on that. So there's a there's a, there's a concept development there. Our ERP provider that's. To be fair, pretty much off the shelf with some links to make sure things work uh, linked together, which is exactly what we're meant to be doing. Um, and then, um, if you look at the um, the other side of that, uh, the vision intelligence that's purely five G. That's purely using five G at its native level. So we've got people we can point you in the direction of, but also we've got people through likes of Steve who we've worked with to do who would or else out there look at pushing it. And I think it's it's. I know I don't have the end technical solution that this will be as a commercial distribution in 10 years' time. It will look completely different. This is just like me developing, you know, John Logie Baird's TV with the guys, and then next week we've got Sony putting on a Bravia. It, 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 that's the sort of level we're, we're, we're looking at. But I'm fine with that because I will get to that point, and then I will enable and help those technologies to get there faster and quicker. And if people come and say, yeah, you know, do this, don't do that, uh, because or try that, and don't try this because it doesn't work. Um, and link these things together and go and talk to A, B, C, D, and E, and they'll give you some advice. And then talk to the likes of the um Worcester 5G, West Berlin's 5G, et cetera, et cetera, to um to, to get the external advice you need to go and put these things in place fully. And sorry, just to make the point out as well, um, you know, Ian's engaged on a DCMS funded project, which is where the obligation comes to share. If yeah, you engage with a test bed, obviously commercially, then what what you find out and what you discover on that journey is entirely yours to keep and do with what you will. Yeah. So the sharing, the sharing is, I think it's great to, to understand the journey that you're going through, but clearly if companies are, are nervous about about that, I think it's a big part of the opportunity the testbed is building that community and network, but equally things can be private and controlled. There's no need to have everything exposed to the world, I guess. Mm. Well, I think I think to be fair, we're in a different position as Steve says. We we have an obligation, but also I'm I'm not I'm not actually developing something that's that, that that's commercially sensitive I don't want other people to see. I'm taking other people's commercial products, developing into a solution that I can then share to other SMEs. And that's why it fits this testbed process and our DCMS project quite so well because it is about sharing. There's, there's also sorry, don't keep diving in there, but there's also the point where Ian Ian talks about his glass factory concept and what he has to learn if he can import that that knowledge and that again up, up, upwards and downwards down that chain as well. Yes. It, that's where you want to share because you're getting the benefit from that sharing too. So yeah, if I can see what my customers got coming in there, but by seeing what their actual workload is and understanding because. You know, although you might not realise it, 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 the supply chain does change its requirements on our on our level of supply from uh, on a daily and weekly basis. Um, we, it, it does affect us, but if I can see that early enough and I can see the effect of that, then I can change my plans more readily and more quickly because I'll see it come through. And if we all had glass factories, it would be a lot easier. Uh, that's a common challenge across most sectors, I think, isn't it? Oh yeah, the, the middle, the, the kind of pitch point, getting hit, hit at both ends. So, I mean, if we can, people can follow your journey, it's going to be a game changer, I think. As we often say, if it wasn't for customers and suppliers, my life would be easy. <laughs>
and competitors. But to be fair, the competitors are a problem. They do the business and suffer exactly like I do. <laughs> Geraldine, I bring you back back in, and um, I mean, with some really important examples of the role of the, of the test bed as a service. What you know, what does it mean to you and the, the test beds that you're running at Digital Catapult? It's very interesting to be able to hear the feedback from the different uh, panelists, especially Ian, and what you're learning from it. You know, we as Digital Catapult, we we launched the first 5G testbed that it could be used commercially in the UK five years ago. And we now have several different 5G testbeds with different functionalities. And this is where we can advise companies from different sectors of which ones are the right ones to configure to join, depending on your business challenges, but not only business challenges, also opportunities. There are companies that are saying, this will be transformational for my business. I can turn this into other products and propositions that I can take back into the market to differentiate my position globally. So it it really is looking at that. And, And what I would say, the piece here missing that I didn't get is, there is a very clear role that the innovators play in creating products that the testbed is critical for them to access. And this is really important because it is, yes, for industry, but also we need to provide access to the innovators, to the startups, to the scale-ups of how do they continue to develop their products or develop products that then in turn are going to be used by industry using Technology, underlying technology is 5G. You know, we've been doing this for IoT as well. We've got a number of test pits across the UK. So it is very important about bringing the ecosystem together, the industry, as well as, you know, leveraging the investment from government and bringing the innovators into play, as well as the investors, right? Because, you know, we run accelerators using the test pits to enable innovators to build the product and then, secure finance and to secure investment for them to be able to take that role into a productionized product that they can then sell into industry. Because even if industry has an excellent use case, if there are no products that use the technology, you won't be able to do that deployment. You won't be able to reach your business impact. So I think that that is a really important point that also a test that provides, but it's not for everyone. Right. You know, there are definitely benefits that like everybody has highlighted, but there is also organizations that want and want to invest in a test bed because they can see multiple use cases that they can develop privately in a 5G private network. And that's OK. You know, it just depends on the circumstances of a company, of how and what is the evaluation, whether you need a test bed or whether you can build one for yourself. And, you know, the skills and even the upgrades and the licenses that you need to be able to manage because there are releases coming, as you all know, every few months. And you need to be able to have the people to upgrade them and ensure that the functionality is still there or the increased functionality is something that you can exploit. And to your point, Duncan, about SMEs in the manufacturing space, you know, we are a partner with... uh, WM5G in running the biggest 5G accelerator in Europe, which is called Spring. And SMEs can come and join that program and develop the business case and being able to have a demonstrator and experiment with that technology without any investment. So it's a great start to not only learn about what the technology can do for them, but learning from other companies that come onto the program. So, you know, that could be a great way, segue that then they go, okay, now we want to invest some time and effort into developing something just for us. But that could be a way forward of how they can experiment without uh, having a direct investment first, apart from resources. I think that's a, Geraldine, that's, I mean, that's a fantastic point, by the way, about the, the innovation ecosystem around that. I mean, we are seeing that. It's interesting. We're, we're part of a, a facility actually in the US at the moment that's a 5G open innovation lab facility. And we're trying to promote the same idea into the UK at the moment. 
And it's built around the concept of building big technology providers, but also venture capital coming together to stimulate startups and the innovation ecosystem to start developing applications for the enterprise and the industrial sector. Uh, and we're seeing a huge success of this now in, in the US market. And we think there's a huge opportunity for a similar like uh, model in, in, in the UK and other markets at the moment to really drive up you know, the startup community to bring these innovative applications, as you mentioned, you know, for the industrial sector. So it's not just a communication technology, but it's actually the applications that are going to deliver on these benefits. Yeah, no, absolutely, Stephen. No, thanks, and Stephen. I mean, what, what I'm hearing here is a clear theme from all of you, actually, that, that the test beds help to de-risk for different communities. So both, you know, as providers of the solutions for a given application, and certainly as, as a manufacturer trying to explore opportunities, but also de-risking, validating solutions for, for investors is a really important part of the, the role test beds can play. We're going to try and leave a little room for some questions in the audience, so um, please pop those three folks, but to, to wrap things up around the, the panel, I think this is, I'm going to ask a question that actually I think you started to answer at the start, Geraldina, but what are the key elements of, of, a, of a strong business case, do you think, for the testbed? Oh, sorry, for, for, um, for 5G and manufacturing? I would think uh, if I can summarise them quickly and give the others an opportunity to comment, use cases, identified use cases, access to operational and financial data for the company that you're developing those business cases for. We need business and market analysis as well. We also need to be able to have stress tests, risk analysis, implementation analysis, an ecosystem mapping, and clear business KPIs that, you, that this business case needs to answer. That's what would be my, my list. That's a great list. Thank you. Uh, who would like to build on that next? Um, I'm going to come back to uh, to Duncan, actually. You know, particularly working with some of the smaller companies and the examples and test beds you've been developing. Yeah, I mean, and I was just musing over the uh, access to data issue because I, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of really small companies don't have that data to hand. And uh, I was just contemplating how you would actually go about helping them to get that data. I mean, one of the things we've found, and this is out of the 5G context, but we, we, we've we found a lot of companies have kind of felt much more comfortable about the business case area. But we, we run a, a one-hour workshop with them where we actually, in a structured manner, help them to identify the sort of the benefit areas they might extract from uh, a piece of technology because actually for them a piece of technology is is not what they're after they're after a solution and and saying that solves an application you know, business problem uh, and and we found that if we can actually help them qualitatively identify the specific benefit areas and then prioritize them it actually makes the the business case if that they, they, they need to put together next something much simpler to do. So I guess it's you know it's helping them not not to be starting from a blank piece of paper would be you know the key from, from our point of view. Yeah, great. So there's a bit of kind of coaching in the process there, isn't there yeah. as well, of building it. Um, Ian, so there's a guy who, who's had to build the case, justify it, invest. Yeah. Well, I can't add anything to Geraldine's list because that's exactly what we had to put in. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I think the, the answer is yeah, it, it is. Um, understanding that um, you know, th th there's a checklist effectively of, of, of having a good business case, which is the list that Geraldine started with. Um, and, and I think part of it is, you know, if we're going to go back out and go back to SMEs that are going to go down this, this, this sort of use case and business case, is explaining why those things are important. Because very often, you know, if we're going to make a capital decision, we buy it because we're going to make something. I'm going to buy a machine because I'm going to make something. I'm going to buy a, um, a new fork truck because I need to move something around, that sort of stuff. When we're doing this sort of thing, that you know, that there's a there has to be a clear understanding that it isn't just about the, um, the, the physical, I can see something working. You've got to be able to prove that there is a clear link um, between what you're doing and the benefits you're receiving. And... and it, it sort of sounds like um, a stupid statement to make, but actually 
once you start looking into it, it's surprising how many other things improve when you start to look at improving something else. So you've got a bit of that that clear link between the two, so that you can prove and evidence it that it's um, that, that, that there's causality there. So um, you certainly, when we when we look at ours, um, you know, we, we, we will be our metrics we've got around us are specifically linked to the improvements we're making with the project rather than could be washily put in because it just happens to be improving because the sun's come out and the temperature's gone up sort of thing. That that, that sort of thing doesn't work. So, yeah, I, I, I can't add anything to Geraldina's list because I think she's um, you know, covered it extremely well. So but it, in terms of it, it's just understanding that those things are asked for a reason um, and, they're, and, and there's a level of rigour required around them. Great. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to leave, I'll bring Mike in a second with some audience questions, hopefully, but very quickly, anything to add to that, um, Steve? Yeah, just a couple of things from my point is um, just having that long-term vision, just because you're starting your digitization journey today or you've not even thought of it before, doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking at this investment to be able to support you over a longer time, let's say, if you're looking at the investing in a network. I think looking at the impact of doing nothing is absolutely critical as well. Um, you know, where, where does that place you? And But for me, especially with the larger organizations, just finally, is, is the, the maturity of them and who, who pays for those benefits? And, and this is maybe a challenge that people have got to overcome. When you're making that business case, if you are focusing on the one space, very often when it reaches that board, you have a director of operations perhaps saying one thing, your factory manager perhaps saying another thing. And I think it's really important that the, the seniors, uh, the chief executives and other board members are able to look across that and just look at how they share those benefits across a wider area based on the returns and think about how that might in, in the input or however they want to justify it in that sense. So that's, that's my my kind of final point there. Great. Thank you, Steve. And Stephen, the, the final comments from um, the guy very, helping people enjoy realise the technology. Very, very quick simplification. Choice overload sometimes just can kill the business case. So if we can, if you can simplify it down to where you need, where to start, and how to start, uh, sometimes can just, you know, actually make, make it actually a project that will succeed. Brilliant. So simplify and target that first business case, use case. Excellent. Exactly. Thank you, folks. Mike, have we got any questions um, you'd like to share with us from the audience? Because we could keep going for another hour here, I think. <laughs> no, great for that. Uh, but yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of questions. One of them actually for me, but uh, uh, some, some questions in general. I know, Geraldine, you mentioned the whole uh, KPI debate earlier on. And for me, it's always a case of, well, what's a good KPI? All right, we're doing some forward thinking, some innovative stuff here. Maybe the traditional KPIs don't work. So how do we know what a good KPI is in a testbed environment like this in terms of whether it's successful or not? And I'll throw this out to the whole panel, actually. Let me, let me start on that, Mike. Yeah. I think good KPI has to be well aligned with uh, business strategies and priorities. You, you've got to start there. You've got to understand how do your use cases address some of the challenges or opportunities that the business have what are the strategic KPIs that the business needs to answer in building the business case? That's the KPIs that I'm referring to. And then you map it out to your financial and your operational data. Cool, great. All right. Then Anyone else want to add to that? I think probably just one area we're starting to see creep into it is, is what we would call the adjacent KPIs, where although the KPI that the company's maybe after is an efficiency, say a cost efficiency, that if it also can trigger an environmental uh, benefit like a CO2 reduction, you know, these, these, these suddenly become these one plus one types of KPIs and, and they're, they're becoming more and more critical. And we're starting to see people even start to look at them and change the idea of the KPI to become like quality of life indicators um, that are creeping in, especially at the board level in many businesses. I realize maybe SMEs aren't as looking at that as much bigger industries, but we're certainly starting to see it. And um, this this demand that like, you know a single KPI, it's it's really cannot trigger another set of you know bigger and broader KPIs that are that are you know that can be delivered and justify the business case. Then, I, I just talk about. I, I think we we sort of do in a roundabout way, Stephen. I think I think it's. It, it again goes back to business size and you end you end up with information overload you end up monitoring things that actually so you you're monitoring this and this and this and this and this um actually for me the the one leads to another in what i'm doing so i can actually show that my efficiency gain directly leads to a, a, a part reduction part part for part reduction in our co2 
um, emissions because I'm making more parts in the same time. So it you know it, it does become uh, there. Um, but I, I I think from a, a corporate level, um, especially with large boards of shareholders looking in, and, and you know if you're expecting your businesses to act in an ethical way, some of these investments are going to improve some of those um, metrics that people look at from the outside when they're investing in you or um, you know or, or working with you. Yeah, thanks, Ian, and everybody. I think it feels like we've come back to where we started. Actually, you know, we start with a, a clear, focused, simple use case, but the benefits cascade across the business as we start to realise um, the opportunity that, that that 5G can bring, and test beds play a key role in in uh, accelerating that. So, uh, thank you all. Thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. I hope you all have watching as well. And uh, Mike, back over to you. Great. I just want to say thank you very much uh, to 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 the to the entire panel. So you know, Duncan, Geraldina, uh, Ian, Steve, Stephen, and Sam. Thank you for uh, uh, chairing the panel. Uh, it, that's always a tough gig, uh, having done enough a number of them myself over the years. So thank you all very much uh, uh, for all your different insights and such at the end of the day. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.